Hello, everyone. <clears throat> um, so this this talk is about Islands of Insight, which has been sort of the labor of love of my team for the last several years. Um, it just came out uh, a little over a month ago now, and uh, there are indeed 10,000 plus handmade puzzles in this game. So the the topic is sort of how we did that and why and, and all of the things that we learned in doing so. Let me start. Um, this slide is just a reminder to show a little bit of the trailer. Uh, and uh, I'm going to play it without sound. But basically, this is, this is what Islands of Insight looks like. It is a large shared open world game that is chock full of puzzles. So if you think of a game like Zelda Breath of the Wild, imagine instead of enemies and dungeons and boss fights, it's just puzzles. It's, it's literally all puzzles. Um, and in addition to that, it is a game that you can play with other people. So you're in this world and there's a hundred other players in the world at the same time as you playing puzzles with you. Um, and this giant world that's full of puzzles, it is not static. The puzzles themselves uh, despawn and respawn every day. So if you log in tomorrow, it will be a different set of puzzles. Um, now, if you come back for weeks and weeks and weeks, you will start to see the same ones over and over again. But there is uh, our gar a gargantuan amount of content in this game uh, that was built by a team of over two dozen puzzle designers. So um, the game is puzzles, puzzles, puzzles of all kinds. Uh, there's a ton of variety in the types of puzzles, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, and it's a game where you, you go around a beautiful open world and solve puzzles. So that's, that's just to give an idea of what the game is. Um, you know, here's, here's a bit of an overview. Um, for those of you who have heard me speak about this game before, it's the one we called Project Sophia back early in development. Um, and we built the, the game in partnership with Behavior Interactive, who published the game, and we couldn't have done it without them. So um, shouts to Behavior Interactive. Um, the game... Uh, got multiple 9 out of 10 review scores. It it won an Editor's Choice Award for CGM. So I guess technically I could call it an award-winning puzzle game, although it just came out a short while ago. Um, there are 28 what we call enclaves, which are puzzle dungeons. And those serve as sort of the single-player campaign for the game. So in addition to this giant open world, which we call the Puzzle Sandbox, there's um, a curated sequence of uh, the things that introduce you to each new puzzle type as you encounter them. So uh, you start off the game, you do a little tutorial, you enter the open world, but then you can go do these enclaves. And they're these floating islands that hang out around the periphery of, um, of the main open world. And you can see on the map, there's all of these little destinations for you to go to. These, these gray rings are the gateway entrances to these enclaves. Um, but then you also have these little side quests and challenges and other little things that you can do in the world. Um, as you progress through the enclaves and complete the challenges, you earn uh, this item we call a Mirabilis. And the size of your Mirabilis collection as it grows will allow you to access new enclaves and gain access to later zones of the game. You also can awaken new puzzle types as you complete the tutorials for them. Sort of you've discovered a new puzzle and then that puzzle will begin to spawn in the world. So um, there are 24 puzzle types in the game, and we segment them into six different categories. They are the grid puzzles, the environmental puzzles, which is sort of stuff that hangs out in the world, the perspective puzzles, which are puzzles where you have to look at a specific angle, um, movement puzzles where you have to run and jump and climb or solve a maze or, or uh, do things quickly, hidden objects, which are not really puzzles. They're more just like things you encounter in the environment that, uh, you know, you might see a little shimmer over in the distance and, oh, that's that's actually something. And when you run over there and touch it, uh, you get rewarded for solving it. And then we have a type called interactive, which are are things that you touch and move and twist and, and play around with in order to sort of reach a final configuration state. They, they might seem more like the types of puzzle mini games you'd, you'd see in other games or puzzle script games or that sort of thing. Um, so in this image alone, I counted and I can spot over 10 different 
puzzle types. And sometimes they kind of blend in. Some of them are off in the distance, um, but th there's, there's a ton of density of puzzles in the game. And wherever you look, you will find them. They say in an open world game, you know, you should find something interesting every 15 seconds or so. It, we, we like to say in Islands of Insight, it's really every two seconds. Like there's just a staggering amount of different puzzles in the environments in the game. Um, just to give a bit of an idea about what you might not be seeing, I'm going to zoom in on this central area right here. And uh, there's actually three secret hidden puzzles right in this image. Um, you'll notice these wavy lines on the ground. If you stand at them from the right location, they make this symbol. And if you find that, you solve a puzzle. Um, there's this archway that when you walk up to it, it kind of forms out of nothing. And if you walk through it, you solve the puzzle. And then there's this hidden secret ring around that fountain that if you touch it, it counts as solving a puzzle. And these are often hidden in clever locations. You have to spot them in the environment. Sometimes you have to fly through them or jump through them. Um, so it's it's not just like deep, thinky logic puzzles. It's sometimes just fun, clever things that the team hides. Um, but let's, let's talk about the grid puzzles because this was the type that we sort of um, emphasize the most as sort of the deep, thinky, like... Uh, set of rules that work well together and allow for a huge amount of expressibility. Um, so I'm going to show you one of the Islands of Insight grids. And you'll notice there's, there's sort of the, the thing in the middle, which is the, the puzzle you have to solve. It consists of light and dark cells. And when you click the cells or interact with them, they switch from the default gray to you can either make them light colored or dark colored. And you have to fill up the entire grid subject to the constraints on the right hand side. And this puzzle has three rules, which is don't make the pattern of two dark colored cells next to one another. And this includes all reflections and rotations of that pattern. Don't make the pattern of two by two light cells and then connect all light cells where the connections are uh, orthogonal. And so you start off the puzzle and, and generally you're just applying the rules. So here, in order to not make a, a two by one of the dark colored cells, you take all the neighbors next to the dark cells and you'll color them light. Um, you might also notice you're very close to making a two by two out of light cells here. So some of these need to be dark. And then of course the light cells all have to be connected. So a cell like this, it kind of has to escape out and you'll, you'll notice some other bottlenecks, say the top middle here. And so we can color those in. And uh, in sort of just repeatedly applying the rules, you'll you'll get your way to the solution. Uh, and you sometimes have to look back and forth between multiple rules. You know, the, the most basic puzzles may only have one rule, but as you get into the game, more and more rules get added and the complexity deepens. And this is, you can see at the bottom center here, there's a two out of five difficulty. Uh, this puzzle, like, uh, you know, you, you basically just have to apply the rules in a pretty simple way that's pretty easy to notice. And that's, typical of a two star difficulty or, or a two out of five difficulty, but the difficulty actually goes higher than five. We have six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 levels of difficulty in the game. And uh, once you get to that level, you're starting to require like very difficult logical deductions uh, to solve the puzzles. Um, once you solve the puzzle, you, you level up that puzzle type. You have masteries for every puzzle. You gain experience. When you gain enough of them, you can do upgrades and you can also earn um, earn rewards for completing all of the puzzles in a, in a certain area of the game or completing a certain number of puzzles. That's sort of the general gameplay loop. Um, so why did we do these grids? Well, we wanted a deep and expressive puzzle system that would allow us to just make uh, a lot of puzzles um, using an amount of rules that would allow us to explore very deeply all of the possible interactions between those rules. And like, we've seen a lot of great puzzle systems in, in other games, you know, the witness monsters expedition, you, you name it. Um, the greatest puzzle games. I think one of the things they all do is they have a, a, a great fundamental system that allows expressing many different ideas. And so we chose light and dark shading puzzles as our sort of canvas to paint on this, uh, this system of different rules. And we we considered every possible puzzle you could think of that could be expressed as a light and dark shading puzzle, you know, many types of pencil puzzles and, and other things. Mm -hmm. And from that, we sort of hand selected a set of rules that we thought worked well together, um, didn't collide too much, but also had interesting interactions when combined with one another. Um, and there's also, you know, the basic features. Uh, we have a hint system, which we call foresight. Uh, that I'll talk a little bit about later. 
Um, and also for our grids, we ensure that there's one solution per puzzle that's reachable with logic alone. We typically don't want people to have to guess. There's usually a, a way to logically to do something. And, you know, there's the whole thing about how deep does logic need to be before it's it's just trial and error. But we'll we'll push that little philosophical issue aside. Uh, the, the goal is basically that you can solve the puzzles with logic. Um, and the grids have a number of different rules, which you can see. Some of them are symbols in the grid, which have a certain constraint that must be obeyed. For example, the area numbers, they, they give the area of the region they're located in. Uh, the letters all have to be connected into collections of the same letter. Uh, you're not allowed to have two different letters in the same region, nor are you allowed to have um, two of the same letter in different regions. Um, so yeah, in total, we had six logic grid symbols and seven logic grid rules. And uh, we also have a few additional grid types. We have complete the pattern grids where you're you're shown a pattern and you need to sort of replicate it throughout the grid. And they can they start out as simple tiling and tessellation things, and they can get all the way up to uh, problems that feel more like Bongard problems or Raven's Matrix or that sort of thing. Uh, we have music grids, which... Um, Sometimes they're just kind of inputting a little rhythm into a drum machine. Sometimes they can be about melodies. Sometimes they can be about chords. Um, there's a lot of different directions they can go. And finally, we have memory grids where you'll be shown a pattern or flashed a pattern. And you have to input as much of it as you can. Of course, you can you can see it multiple times. Um, some of the puzzle rules can actually be shockingly deep. So one of the puzzle rules is don't make this pattern, which... Uh, is, is sitting here. But uh, we programmed it so that you could have any pattern you wanted as the forbidden pattern. So in this case, it's something like a two by two square. And in the example you saw earlier, it was a one by two. But um, through making other types of patterns forbidden, you can actually uh, sort of create new rules just out of that. And I'll give you one example. This puzzle has don't make this pattern and it's in a T shape. So you're not allowed to make any T shapes out of the dark tiles and all rotations of that T shape are forbidden. And that essentially forces the solution of the puzzle to be a linear path. And in this case, you're sort of given where the two ends are, but if you're not, then uh, you might have to solve for where they are, or maybe it's a loop and not a path. It could also be a, a two by two shaded region. Uh, but this sort of allows us to create snake puzzles or path puzzles in a game that is ostensibly about uh, light and dark colored grids. So don't make this pattern with something that we just gained so much mileage of. Um, and the forbidden patterns, they can also contain multiple colors. So another example is if you take a, a two by two where three of the cells are dark and one of the cells is light and you forbid that pattern, and that essentially forces all of the dark regions to be rectangular. So you can get uh, sort of rectangle puzzles, um, rain clouds, maybe something like Shikaku, if you had those types of rules in the game, that sort of thing, just from don't make this pattern. Um, you know, this, there, there might be some sense in which don't make this pattern is, is almost like, uh, uh, like NP complete or, or, or something like that, right? You could build sufficiently difficult gadgets so that with don't make this pattern alone, you can express almost anything that, that can be expressed in a finite piece of the grid, right? So there's, um, there's something very clever and interesting about it that we learned and discovered as we played around with it more. Anyways, this is the total puzzle count. Um, and the, the goal was actually not this. Our goal when we started was 3,000 grids and 9,000 puzzles total. Um, not really for any particular reason other than I, I wanted to just say it's over 9,000 and use the Dragon Ball Z meme. Um, but we ended up with a lot more than that. And uh, you can divide it up in a few different ways. One such way is there are 1674 in the enclaves. And it's it's actually not just the enclaves. It's the enclaves and the side quests. So it's essentially the, the main campaign of the game. And then there's another 14.7K sandbox puzzles that spawn randomly in the five different zones and cycle every day. Um, and if you want to divide it up by how they're created, the sort of 1,100 that were computer generated of certain types, there were 5,000 hidden objects, and then there were over 10,000 handmade puzzles that were not the hidden objects. I mean, they're, they're hand-placed. Um, but there were over 10,000 handmade puzzles 
about 40% of which were logic grids. So uh, it, it's a lot. Um, it, it ended up being a lot. Um, so the question is maybe why? Why did we do that? Um, and let me take you back to about four years ago when I was initially pitching this game. Um, it was sort of the, the start of the pandemic and all of the conferences uh, of the year had all been canceled. And so I, I was pitching the game remotely uh, because every conference went online. And um, I, the vision for this game at the time was like, look at something like Grandmaster Puzzles. If you're familiar with this, it's, uh, it's a blog that has the most brilliant and beautiful puzzles you could ever see. Um, and there are many other blogs like it that have beautiful and brilliant logic puzzles. Sometimes they're by a single author. Sometimes it's a collection of authors that are publishing them together in a blog. Um, but these puzzles are awesome. And I've written for this blog. I know many other people who have. And um, a, a question to me was like, what does it actually, uh, what, how much does it actually cost to make that kind of puzzle? Like those puzzles are so good. We should have them in video games. But but what does it actually cost to do that, right? How, how much effort does it take? And um, I, I've revised the title of the slide to what does a high quality puzzle cost to make? Because there's lots of ways of making puzzles for cheap. But this is sort of what we found when we tried to make them for Islands of Insight. Is like, if you want to place a single hidden object, um, you can easily do 10 or 15 of those in an hour and still have them be in clever and interesting places. Obviously, if you want them to be in not clever places, you can just plop, plop, plop and put hundreds of them in an hour. Um, but for a good one, uh, you know, you, you can still do quite a lot of them. And that makes the cost of them for somebody, uh, a puzzle designer that's earning a good, uh, you know, good pay for their work. Uh, you can get those down to two dollars a puzzle. Right. Very simple environmental puzzles where you have to place two blocks or place a few hidden objects. They might be five bucks each. Simple logic puzzles, somewhere between $10 and $15. Um, a more complex environmental puzzle where you have to like, you know, we, we have racing puzzles where you have to touch multiple things or these rings you have to fly through, we have to place multiple rings. They can be more. Um, and for a, a more high quality logic puzzle, like the type that you would see on Grandmaster puzzles, it's higher still. Um, if you add in the cost of curation and testing and editing, like every puzzle that gets submitted, we still have to review it and make sure it's good and put it into the game and all that. Um, but uh, even when you add that, it's it's like 50 bucks, right? So the average marginal cost of one puzzle in the game is probably less than $50, Um you know, and by that, by that, I mean, if we had to add 100 more puzzles, it would probably cost less than 5,000 more dollars, given where we're at now. Um, you know, and so a, a thought experiment is uh, big open world games, they have budgets in the millions, right? Often in the tens of millions. And they're spending a million bucks on characters or environments or several million on cinematics, right? Um, but if really good puzzles are like 50 bucks each, do the math, you could make 10,000 of them for half a million dollars. And if you're making a big open world puzzle game and content is king, that's a totally reasonable amount to spend on the main primary content of the game, right? So there, there's some economic understanding that an opportunity existed to make a game with a lot of puzzles that we didn't see anybody else doing. Um, you know, I, I make this joke that like, uh, if you look at The Witness, which is a brilliant game and I love it, uh, a very uncharitable way of looking at The Witness is, well, it's like $10,000 a puzzle, right? If you look at how many puzzles that game has and how much it costs, right? Um, obviously, that game does some remarkable things with the puzzles and it's way more than the sum of its parts. So I don't think that's a fair way of looking at the game at all. But just in, in the sort of like really dumbed down, just do the math, that's what it ends up being. So... Um, you know, that, that kind of inspired us to look at a different economy of scale of how we would build the content for a puzzle game. Um, so, and, and what is the conclusion of all that? Well, if you have low marginal cost and you have high puzzle quality, we felt there's an opportunity to create something that had never been created before. That's, that's basically the bottom line there. Um, so what are the benefits of making lots of puzzles? Well, 
it could enable new ways of delivering content. Daily puzzles have got really popular. You know, Wordle kind of blew up, but you have the New York Times, you have Puzmo, they're, they're publishing multiple puzzles a day of different types. Um, and that's, that's sort of interesting. And that requires a continuous treadmill of content to keep it running. Um, you could do stuff like the sandbox mode in Islands of Insight, new puzzles every day, just uh, a way to keep people coming back. You could think about additional game modes, things you could do with a lot of puzzles that you couldn't do with a little. Um, it also allowed us to improve the quality of the most important puzzles. Like when you have this library of 10K puzzles and you need to make like this dungeon that's early in the game and everybody's going to have to play it. Like you can go through and pick out the absolute best ones, the cream of the crop, the true gems in order to have them in that very important place that every single person is going to interact with. And it's sometimes it's not always the most clever or the smartest. Sometimes it's the ones that just like people really love for some kind of weird reason or the ones that were the best at teaching people something. Um, and, and the other thing, and we'll get more into this, is that economies of scale are a virtuous cycle in production. Because if, you're, if your marginal cost of making one puzzle is lower, then you can make more of them. But when you're making a lot of them, suddenly there's, there's opportunities to save more on each puzzle. Like um, if you're making 10 puzzles, you probably don't need very advanced tools to do them. But if you're going to make thousands, then suddenly you can invest in your tooling because that investment is going to have a, a positive rate of return if you're going to use it 4,000 times. Right. So that that drives down the cost further. And so you get this virtuous cycle of the economy of scale of making a lot of puzzles. Um, and but but there's a lot of challenges. Right. Like we basically needed to um, like at all times when we're designing puzzles, when we're figuring out tooling for them and figuring out how production works, we needed to keep in mind the, the need to maintain for most of the game that low marginal cost of content creation. Um, so. Uh, a lot of things to think about and a lot of challenges. And that's that's kind of the heart of the talk. Um, so let's talk about the design of the puzzle types. Um, this is sort of the puzzle version of design for manufacturing. You know, I'll give the example of a, an aluminum beverage can, right? Why is it the way it is? Well, almost everything about the way a, a pop can is designed is so that it can be manufactured cheaply from, uh, you know, sheet metal aluminum, uh, an ingredient that's that's relatively inexpensive. Um, and so the same thing for us, like the types of puzzles we have in the game, they need to be ones where it's relatively quick to create individual instances and they're enjoyable for players even after playing them many times. So it can't be a puzzle where once you know all the tricks, it's well, once you know all the tricks, it's boring. Um, they also need to afford a good opportunity for the puzzle designers to really express themselves, to be clever and creative and to kind of do unusual things that delight and surprise the players. Um, and the more a puzzle type allows that to happen, the better a fit it is for Islands of Insight, because it means we can unleash this team of puzzle designers and say, go nuts, make cool stuff. And they'll continue to make more and more things that delight the players. Um, I, I am reusing a slide from a previous talk I gave on this. Um, Thomas Snyder has this notion of the, the capacity of a puzzle and he describes it as, you know, if you take a puzzle type like say Sudoku and you got a divine being to make the ultimate Sudoku book that had every interesting thing in there once, but no more, how many Sudoku puzzles would it actually have? And for him, that's sort of how many Sudokus he would want to do in his life in ideal circumstances, right? And he thinks for Sudoku, it might be something like 80. And for other puzzle types, it can be much higher. Um, it can be many different magnitudes. You know, a simple maze, once you've done one, you kind of know how to do it. Uh, game like Portal, there are some interesting tricks, but once you get past the sort of, you know, first 10 or so basic Portal gun tricks, you need to start adding in the gun turrets and the lasers and the companion cube and all of that to, to sort of get more depth out of the system. Uh, so maybe Sudoku's like 100, a system like The Witness with a lot of different moving parts, and I would put Islands of Insight in here perhaps as well, uh, is more on the range of, of 1,000. With Go problems, I honestly believe you can get 10,000 plus because there's just so many things you could express. And I mean, I honestly kind of want to revise this slide because I think the number 1,000 for The Witness is too low. After doing Islands of Insight, I think that puzzle designers are so clever and so creative. There's, they have so many ideas. There's so many things that they can create from simple rules that um, there's way more you could do. Now, I mean, 
the question might be like, uh, at what point are you just making something really convoluted and you're better off like adding more rules rather than making what you can out of the, the given rules. Sometimes uh, there is delight in being able to express something complex out of a simple ingredient. And that's kind of the whole point. But, um, you know, the, the point stands that like we wanted to create a system whose capacity is very high, sort of on the order of four digits. Um, but we, we also found that that restriction was a bit too much. Like a lot of players actually take a lot of joy and delight in applying the same tricks over and over again. Like when they learn X-Wings in Sudoku, they actually like doing a bunch of Sudoku puzzles and, and using X-Wings over and over again to solve them. Um, they like practicing and applying things over and over. Uh, some players just want to chill out. Like we found players who... Um, they're really good at solving puzzles, but their ideal flow state is actually just doing a lot of easy puzzles really quickly. Um, and I think there are some types of heavily thinky games that they select for an audience of people who love the difficulty and love the sort of like bashing their head against the wall, uh, trying to learn something really challenging. Um, but there's, there's also a lot of other audiences who love puzzle games, and that isn't necessarily the way they want to enjoy the content. So our approach is a lot more balanced. Um, you know, we, we describe it sometimes as like a low dose versus a high dose experience. Um, we also talk about flow puzzles versus gem puzzles. A flow puzzle is one where you never really have to stop and think. You're just kind of on autopilot the whole time. Like people who play Minesweeper, they'll open Minesweeper and they'll just go, 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 go. Their mouse never stops moving. They're kind of on autopilot for most of the time. Um, and a lot of players find that state really enjoyable and that's actually what they want. Um, and we tried to design the game, both the open world and the enclaves, to allow players to self-select into sort of what path they wanted to be on. Like if they want to do the difficult content, it is right there. There are shockingly hard puzzles very close to the start of the game. We've, we've seen YouTube videos of people who got trapped there for a long time and they're just beginning the game. You know, we, we might've gone overboard in that sense. Um, but we really did want to allow players to kind of choose their own path through the game. Um, the other thing it can do is it can ease players into difficulty. Like, if somebody does a puzzle type and they do 10 of them and they're all relatively straightforward and then they get to number 11 and then it's hard, uh, we find that they actually become incredibly motivated to solve it. Sometimes it can even be a dangerous trap if the puzzle is too hard and we really want them to give up. But um, many players are afraid of difficult puzzles and just giving them a lot of easy ones helps. Um, I mean, I think this can be used in, in nefarious ways if you see some types of these like predatory mobile games that will deliberately give a bunch of easy puzzles and then give you a hard one and make you spend money. Um, but we, we don't have any of that here. It's just motivating players to, to love the game and to want to continue it. Um, let's talk about one puzzle type, which are these wandering echoes. And this is, it's, it's not even really a puzzle. Um, it's a type of mini game that you see in many open world games. Um, and it's, you touch an orb and it runs away from you and you have to touch it a few times and eventually you catch it. Um, and we have these in our game as many other games do. Um, but they can be so many things. Like that one idea can express a lot. They can be tutorials that just show you where to go. They can be a guidance down the path. They could lead you to a secret or a shortcut or maybe a hidden room where there's some other puzzle. They could be speed run challenges where the time it takes for you to catch up to it really matters because if you don't, it will restart. They could be platforming challenges. Maybe this thing is kind of bouncing along uh, something that's difficult to jump to. Uh, they can be hide and seek. Sometimes a thing runs away from you. It runs around the corner and you're like, where'd it go? Um, they can be tricks. And what I mean by that is sometimes the way you solve these will require you to use some other things in the game. Um, I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, there are ways of moving in the game that may be faster than just the, the regular walking or gliding uh, movement. You know, there are teleporters, there are jump pads, there are other ways of getting around and they're, they may be required for something in the game. Um, uh, and also, uh, you can use these things to create something memorable without necessarily programming a new puzzle into the game, right? So this is an area, we call this the dance of the fireflies. And there's one of these wandering echoes and you go up and touch it. And then it, it splits into, I think, 12 of them. 
and uh, they all start spinning around you and then they all go off in their own directions and you could solve them one at a time. You don't have to touch them all at once. But the point being that just by placing the puzzles in an interesting configuration, we're able to create something unique and different and memorable uh, without adding new puzzle types to the game. So we found a lot of ways of using those ingredients and combining them to make something more than just here's another puzzle. And because we had so many puzzle designers and they're so creative and they come up with all these ideas, we really ended up with a lot of this kind of stuff in the game. Um, here's another example. This is a, a grid puzzle that you can find near the end of the, the single player campaign. And this one was sort of designed as a capstone um, to the uh, sort of mandatory part of the campaign. And there's you can see there's five different rules on the right hand side. They come from the five different uh, chapters of the single player campaign, essentially. And there's, there's all these different symbols and they, uh, there's these nine different chunks of the grid, but they interact with one another and you kind of have to flow the logic from one portion to the other. It, you know, it's, um, it's a deeper and more interesting puzzle that is designed to be memorable because it comes at a certain time and it reflects themes in a certain way. And we do take the time to kind of put those little, um, important gems in the game where we can. It's not just a bunch of, uh, you know, puzzle after puzzle after puzzle. We do do some elaborate one-offs. These are things in the game that are just, you know, uniquely created. They're often woven into the environment. This is sort of a, a grid puzzle that lives physically in the world and you have to figure out what it means and solve it. Um, these floating stone things over this uh, temple here, they are a puzzle. And I will not spoil what it is, but but they mean something. Um, this uh, this we call this the uh, all-seeing monolith, and it's uh, it basically is just a um, a puzzle that helps you find interesting locations in the map, and then they they sort of reveal these lasers, and you have to chase them down and find more of them. But uh, this is not a puzzle that we have hundreds and hundreds of in the game. We have exactly five of them. So uh, we do sometimes put in the higher effort on specific things, but uh, like we know that these things are not scalable in the way that we want all of the other content of the game to be. So um, we kind of pick and choose and mix and match and try and find a good balance. Um, when you go to implement the puzzles, the simplest thing is almost always better. The fact that we're doing a multiplayer game and I mean, it's an online game with persistence. It means that certain types of bugs become more difficult, right? Like there are certain types of bugs where you might have to deploy the game to Steam in order to even reproduce the problem or to identify what's going on. Like when you make a little local build, uh, the bug might not even exist, right? So that increases the cost of QA. It increases the cost of reproducing bugs, checking if they're fixed. Um, and the bugs themselves can be a lot harder. So uh, the cheap bug to fix is always like, oh, the puzzle is broken. It's play strong. It has no solution because you can check those things locally. You can fix them locally. You can see that the fix is done. Um, and typically only one person is needed to do that. And it's often a five or 10 minute thing. Um, so we try to implement puzzles in a way where we simplify stuff down to the, the bare bones basics and uh, create less of the costly bugs and more of the cheap bugs. I mean, we don't want to create more bugs, but we prefer the bugs to be the, the simple ones. Um, the whole team had 27 puzzle designers and you can see them there listed in the credits. Um, it was a mix of full-time staff, part-time contractors, as well as a, a large number of four month co-ops or summer interns or other uh, students who worked with us full-time for a, a time limited period. The vast majority of these people had never worked on a video game before. Many of them had written pencil puzzles or small puzzle script games or had programming experience, but not game dev. Um, but they nonetheless did absolutely great. However, because they weren't game devs, they weren't level designers necessarily, we needed to sort of um, build tooling that allowed them to be productive without having to like learn how to use all of Unreal Engine, right? So how did we do that? Um, well, we built a lot of in-engine tools. We also built a lot of outside of the engine tools and we set up a puzzle database that contained basically every puzzle in the game and had great tooling to allow us to view and modify and edit those puzzles. So let's start with the in-engine tooling. This is a screenshot of 
what the game looks like when you just load up every puzzle into a zone in the editor. It's just complete chaos. There's puzzles everywhere. Um, you can see these, these white lines. Those are the splines that determine the paths of the wandering echoes. And uh, some of the points are points where the wandering echoes will stop, and others are just uh, control points that you can use to guide their movement. You can see also there's, there's these gray rings. Those are for the, the hidden objects so that they're easy to see in the editor. We have this sort of editor-only invisible gray ring. Um, and you'll also see in the top right, there's a list of commands that you can use when interacting with these splines in order to place them more conveniently. So we, we built custom placement tools for about half the puzzles in the game, essentially the ones that uh, their location and the environment is very important. And that saved us a lot of time in actually populating the world with tons and tons of these puzzles. Um, you know, and, and what is our goals with tooling? Basically, minimize the amount of work needed to produce the puzzles in all steps, creation, testing, curation, and deployment. Uh, eliminate toil, any kind of repetitive labor that's just absolutely brainless. Like, computers are great at that. Make sure the computer's doing it. Um, reducing the probability of mistakes, like anything that gets accidentally misclicked, like, you know, just choosing really good defaults for things. Like, should this checkbox be default on or default off? That saves a lot of headaches. Um, avoiding repetitive strain injury, like this is a big concern for us. When you're working in this map and you're just like constantly clicking things to move stuff around, that's that's really hard on your wrists sometimes. And anything that we can do to save people keystrokes and mouse movements is really important to us. Um, and I mean, the, the sum total of everything is just like, we want to maximize the quality of life for our puzzle designers so that they love their job and have the opportunity for their creativity to shine. Um, for the logic puzzles, we used web tools only. Um, you know, we used simple HTML tools, simple human readable puzzle formats. Um, we did some JavaScript stuff, but like nothing, um, you know, uh, like the, the puzzle website is sort of a web 1.0 website. It's not like, there's no Ajax. There's no, um, like, you know, you just edit a puzzle and you click save, right? Like there, there's, there's nothing, um, super involved about an interaction between what's running on your web browser and what's happening on the server other than saving and loading from a database. Um, you know, we found many of the people that wanted to work with us, they didn't even have PCs that were powerful enough to um, load up the game in Unreal Engine. And these are people who are not submitting thousands of puzzles or working for months. These are people that we just like, we want to get a few puzzles from them. They might submit a few dozen. And so we don't want them to have to like install an engine and load up a game just in order to make a logic puzzle. So using web-based tools uh, solved that problem and it massively increased our submission rates and the overall level of participation from these wonderful puzzle designers. It also allowed us to test and curate puzzle packs without um, having to open the engine every time. Like when, you, when you're making a big open world game, by the time you get to the end, even just hitting compile can be five or 10 minutes. Uh, and it really does help if you don't have to do that. This is a screenshot of um, the, uh, the tool that we use to edit the logic grids. We call it SOPACT, which stands for Sophia Puzzle Authoring and Curation Tool. Uh, it is a private fork of the MIT licensed Puzzlink or PZPRV3 repo, which if any of you want to make a tool, this is this is free to use, or it's a free place to start. Um, you can see it has all of the, the rules of the game in there. And uh, you can basically make a grid, test a grid, record the solution. Uh, you can time the solutions. Um, there's a lot of helpful things like all of the most commonly used no pattern templates are all at the bottom. So you can just click them so you don't have to enter them manually over and over again unless you're going to use an unusual one. We just did everything we could to make, um, make this as simple and as straightforward as possible for anyone who's editing or designing a puzzle. We had other web tools for some of the other puzzle types. Um, this is a rolling block puzzle. This is a match three puzzle. You can just create them in a, in a little website, export a file, and that, that's it. It goes into the game. Um, the puzzle database had a lot of features by the end. We could tag puzzles with different rules that they used. We had scripts to automatically tag puzzles so we could sort them into which zone we wanted them to spawn in. You can search by tag or by name or by author, by date, basically anything. Um, of course, you can edit the puzzles. 
Uh, we recorded the solution to every grid in order to facilitate the hint system. We would do a, a very specific recording where we solve the puzzle in, in order from most obvious step first always. And then we point out to the player by flashing a cell in the grid what uh, the next place is in the grid that they haven't uh, looked at yet, just as a way of guiding their attention to a place where they can make progress. And that's our hint system. Um, but it was made possible by the fact that we had this database that allowed us to record all that information. We also timed the solution so you can see how long somebody took on one of these grids, and that might give us a hint as to whether or not it's difficult. It also allowed us to share a puzzle with a link just over Discord. We, we work on Discord. If you work on Slack or Teams, it would be the same thing, um, as well as to sort puzzles in spreadsheets or docs just using links because... Uh, you wouldn't believe the number of times you're looking through a document and you want to see what's this puzzle again, or you want to change it and having to like type the number in and search it and click it. Like it's so much, so much time you'll save by just making everything a link. Um, of course, the difficulty ratings are stored in here. Every puzzle has a comments feed and everybody can edit it. Like it's, it's not complex. It's not like a forum. It's, it's just one text field and people can, can sort of edit it and hit save. Um, if two people do it at the same time, probably one person's is going to get nuked, but who cares, right? Like um, simple, efficient, lean tooling is, is what we have here. Um, it also allows us to set when puzzles are live. Um, you know, in theory, that could be used for all kinds of things that we're not currently using it for. But um, yeah, it, it was a really powerful tool that we built. And if we ever had to do something this big, I would 100% do just about all of these things again. Um, we always get this question about what about computer generation? And by that, I, I don't mean like generative AI or anything like that. I, I just mean like using algorithms to help you generate puzzles. Um, and we experimented a lot with sort of classical puzzle generation algorithms. And depending on which puzzle type, it can be absolutely fantastic or it could be horrible. In the best case, you get puzzles that are better than a human could ever make, or it could be the key to making a new puzzle type work entirely. Um, you know, in a good situation, it produces consistently good and varied puzzles for sort of, I guess, marginal cost, almost zero. Um, sometimes it produces average quality puzzles that need a lot of tweaking or curation. Or you have to throw a bunch of them out. Um, in the bad case, it's time consuming. It's hardly worth the effort. And, and sometimes it's just an enormous time seek that yields nothing of value. You write all these algorithms and, you know, it just it doesn't end up creating what you want. And we experienced, I think, all of the above. Um, but often we found it's just a good middle step. Like if you generate a bunch of puzzles and then you curate them and tweak a few of them, that can be a way to save a bit of time. Um, and your generator doesn't need to be perfect. Like if your generator makes 50% great puzzles and 50% garbage, like that's probably good enough because if you're testing a bunch of puzzles and picking out say a hundred good ones to ship in the game, um, you know, you could, uh, either improve your generator from 50% to 70% or 80%, or you could just like test an extra 50 puzzles. And that's probably less work than improving the generator. So the point at which you should stop making the generator better may be way less if, if you just need to select a subset of its output. Um, we often found that our puzzle team could outperform the generators. There's this an example in, in one of the quests for perfections of the game where we had a bunch of generated logic grids for a QFP and I think we didn't like them or they were too hard or um, we, we didn't have an appropriate set for the first chapter. And Jeffrey Barden, who I can see he's, he's hanging out in the chat, um, he went and he did like 50 or 60 of them in one afternoon. And they were simple puzzles for beginners, small grids, you know, six by six ish grid sizes. Um, but he just knocked them out and they were all amazing high quality puzzles. And no matter how good the generator was, you'd probably have to spend more time than that just looking through its output in order to find that many that were that good, right? So um, there are scales at which generation is great. You know, if you need 100,000 puzzles, uh, you know, I've seen games like 14 Minesweeper variants that that have a even larger scale than we have, and it's, it's through that means. Um, but you may not need generation as much as you think you do. Um, let me talk about another puzzle, the shifting mosaic. Uh, this is a puzzle where you slide the blocks around and your goal is to get the gold colored block into the gold colored region. I'm going to give you uh, well, the, this is a traditional puzzle called Klotsky. 
And the shifting mosaic is basically a, a similar to this type of puzzle. In this case, you have to slide the red block out the bottom. But in our case, the goal can be anywhere in the grid. Uh, let me show you one example. This is one from our game. Um, and uh, this gold bar right here is the thing you can move. And this gold slot over here is where you have to put it. Um, and you know, you'll, you'll start to slide these blocks over. You can slide the gold one over. And then you can move this piece on the left down to the next slot, which gives you more room to push the gold bar further to the left, which gives you more room to take the horizontal bar at the top and move it down to the bottom, which then gives you more room to get the gold bar to the right and, uh, and so on. You think you see the pattern. You think you're almost done here, but actually there's a little snag at the end. These three pieces, you know, you'll kind of move them around and you realize, uh, I can't actually get this one piece to the right-hand side where I need it to be. It doesn't fit. So there's a little snag at the end and you have to sort of rotate the three pieces around uh, in the other direction so that they're diagonally opposite in the other configuration. And then you can slide the the long skinny piece between them. And from there, you can quickly get it to the final configuration. But this is this is one of these shifting mosaic puzzles that's in the game. Um, and uh, this is this is produced by one of our uh, co-op students. He, he drew this to illustrate the difference between a puzzle like the classic um, Klotsky puzzle versus the one on the right. The one on the left, it can be in, I think, hundreds of thousands of different configurations. There's no one solution. And it takes 100 plus moves to solve it. The one on the right has very few configurations, I think less than 100, and can be solved in a small number of moves, but it's surprisingly tricky. It, it requires uh, a little bit of an underhanded trick, secret move that is sometimes a little bit hard to spot. It looks simple, but it honestly isn't. Um, and so we had this thought, like, could these be generated? And actually, um, we had this idea this is a paper that I absolutely love. It talks about how to rate the difficulty of Sokoban puzzles. And they do it by looking at all of the possible configurations that the, the Sokoban puzzle can be in. And they notice that in hard puzzles, there's often this bottleneck in the state space, where as a player, you, you have to do some kind of key move to get the to the exit. And in this diagram, they're showing like, you know, on the left, uh, this is what a human does, where the circle is how much time they spend in that state. Uh, and this is what a random walking AI does. But the point being that once they get through this bridge in the middle, they tend to very quickly find their way toward the goal. So this really is the key step and the bottleneck in getting to the solution. So we kind of thought, like, could we do the same thing? And this is work by Yang Zhang, who's one of our uh, summer students. Um, and we developed this method that creates randomized puzzles according to some heuristics, analyzes the state space graph, and kind of you know tweaks the puzzle a bit if it's too easy or too hard, but essentially produces shifting mosaic puzzles. And you take hundreds of them, and you just select from them a subset of them that have not too many state spaces, so the pieces can't become too jumbled up, but also have that key move that's needed to solve them. And the way you find puzzles with key moves is you have to have an articulation point or a cut vertex in the state space graph. Um, and at first we thought maybe you just need a high in degree because many times when you have that uh, articulation point, it's kind of just like a trivial move at the start of the end. It's not something interesting. But the, the ingredient that was actually helpful was finding articulation points where multiple pieces are movable because they tend to be less obvious and more difficult to spot. And once that was put into the generator, it started selecting real gems that were absolutely fabulous. So there are a couple hundred of these totally generated shifting mosaics in the game. Um, and they're wonderful and I love them. Uh, we did it for a few other puzzle types. The Sentinel Stones are a geometry-based puzzle, and they're entirely computer-generated using a bunch of sort of computational geometry in order to place um, place these cylinders so that uh, there's only one place to stand where you can see all of them without being blocked by others. Um, the armillary rings is similar. It's a sort of geometry construction. We tried generating match three puzzles, just the, the sort of uh, reverse algorithm. You take an empty board and then in backwards order, generate the blocks as they would have been, and then apply selection on that to try and find interesting ones, one where there isn't just one solution. And we threw a bunch of those into a challenge we called the match three speed round, where you just have to solve a bunch of match threes really quickly. We have one that's the easier block of puzzles and one that's harder. Um, Overall, I'm not sure we saved much time compared to how long we would have spent if we had done these manually, but it definitely created a different sort of flavor of the puzzles 
Um, and if we wanted this to be an infinitely infinite thing, you know, we could have a daily match three speed round challenge or something like that, right? There's there's things that we could do with a large number of puzzles. Um, let's see. We have the sky drops. These were originally created to be purely placed uh, in level geometry. I'll show you what they are. You just see these spheres in the sky, but if you stand in the right place, they form circles and you click that and you solve them. Um, and we wanted these to be a puzzle in the game where they just spawn infinitely. They never repeat. So you never actually run out of them. Um, and uh, But we also found that human-placed ones, we could do way more clever things. You know, our, our level designer, our environment team, they love putting sky drops in just like hilariously cool places. So, um, you know, it is nice to have the infinite supply of them, but it's also amazing to have the human touch. And the fact that we have both in the same game um, really, uh, I think, you know, it, it speaks to the strengths of both approaches. Um, so let's talk about production. I, I don't have that much time left. The number one thing, hire great people, teach them to use the tools, do whatever you can to support them creatively. Um, give them feedback early and often. Many of our, our puzzle designers, they make stuff that's too hard and they need to be told many times. Um, they need to watch people play test their puzzles so they can ex see them experiencing the difficulties. Um, we swap tasks around a lot so people wouldn't get too bored. It also allowed us to make different zones of the map feel different because there were different puzzle designers in different zones. Uh, we try to avoid overmanaging them. We don't create one task per puzzle. We just sort of have a spreadsheet where it's kept track of. It's, it's low key and it's easy. Um, a few challenges. Um, creating tutorial sequences, especially for environment puzzles, uh, requires dependency between the environments and the puzzles. So, you know, we need a puzzle designer who's also a level designer who understands environments to do it. And often uh, we would create these sort of, uh, we call them puzzle U maps, but it's basically um, not really a gray box. It's even less than that. It's like just showing the sequences of puzzles and like where you want it to branch and fork and what depends on what versus what is stuff that can be done in any order. And then uh, level designers can kind of build around that. Um, environment changes were pretty painful. Like if somebody moves a rock and there's a puzzle sitting on that rock, it will suddenly be broken. So we adopted this red box approach of when you fix something in the environment, you just kind of stick a red box in a certain map. And then the puzzle team will go through and clean up any puzzles that are inside red boxes, just basically verify them that they're still working. Um, the puzzle distribution is a challenge. We had too many of certain rules and too few of others. And at some point we did a puzzle census where we sort of built scripts to look at all the puzzles and see how many of we, each type were there and figure out the ones that we needed more of. Um, file conflicts are an issue. In Unreal Engine, you can't merge uh, edits that two people make to the same map. So we just divided every puzzle type in every zone into its own sub map. We ended up with hundreds of sub maps in the final map, um, which seemed to work just fine. Overall, these issues are pretty minor and the puzzle production was highly successful. Like we overshot our target number of puzzles and um, I think also did extremely well on quality. Um, a brief note on testing. Every puzzle has to get tested and I don't necessarily just mean play testing. I mean just basic QA. Like does the puzzle work? Can you solve it? Does it have a unique solution? Is it high enough quality to be in the game? Um, Jeffrey Barden did a huge amount of this for almost every puzzle type in the game. Um, you know, he would get other people to test his puzzles, but he essentially played every single puzzle in the game, all 16K of them. Um, you know, we try to make testing fast and cheap and simple. Um, you know, if stuff can be tested in a web-based tool, we want it to be. Um, you know, there's this mantra in QA that like QA should only QA on packaged builds. And like, uh, we had to abandon that because it just added too much inefficiency to the process. Like there were many puzzles in the game that we only tested them in the, the editor. We never tested them in game, um, but we never had a problem with that. Um, you know, fixing problems quickly, like our QA staff, they were all puzzle designers. They were all people who know how to fix a puzzle and they all submitted and made puzzles themselves. So um, it, it removed a communication step in fixing a broken puzzle or anything with an issue. Um, let's see, curation. So one of the things that made it easier to sort of select the puzzles for the enclaves and the side quests is just like tagging and, and keeping meticulous sort of spreadsheet planning throughout the design. Like whenever somebody came up with a theme or an interesting idea, we would start collecting puzzles that used that theme or interesting idea. And then later we would decide, well, is this enough to be a side quest or a series or one of the insights in the encyclopedia, something like that? Like 
uh, we did a pretty good job of record keeping throughout the, the process. Um, and also we, we sometimes found that we just like, we needed to demonstrate a certain insight. We needed a tutorial for a mechanic and identifying those gaps and filling them in. We also did a lot of just quality passes. We would do play testing of each of the dungeons or the enclaves and then go through and make new puzzles, improve existing ones, just kind of call the worst ones and add better ones. Um, we spent a lot of time on the spawning and cycling algorithms. Honestly, that could be a whole talk of its own, but the biggest thing is just like deciding which puzzle types go in which zones and having tooling that allow us allowed us to do that and move them around relatively easily and sort of figure out the counts, figure out how many of each type we, we needed versus how many we had. And um, sometimes when we had too many of a puzzle, we would just set it to have 10 days of cycling rather than seven, right? The puzzle density is sort of just the number of puzzles divided by the number of days. So the, the second thing is an easy thing to tweak if the first one isn't. Um, we had special considerations for hard puzzles. They all went into a hard pool. We set them up to spawn in certain parts of the map at certain times and, you know, handpicked a few key ones to put in certain areas. Um, keeping that in mind was pretty important. Um, I got two minutes left. Closing thoughts. Uh, there's, there's really only one thing. And it's, it's the number one thing that I feel allowed this part of the project to be successful, which is the incredible talents of all the puzzle designers that we worked with. Um, you know, the number one thing I learned is that game dev experience doesn't matter at all. The vast majority of these people had never worked on a video game before, and they learned everything extraordinarily quickly. Uh, you know, they, they were able to use the tools that we built for them. And they also helped make those tools. They helped develop them. Um, they helped improve them. And, um, you know, some of them had a programming background. Some of them just had a general design background. Um, but a lot of the most valuable contributions we had came from first timers who some of them had never had a real job before. Um, some of them were university students that just had a summer off. And, um, you know, you throw them into an environment where they can thrive and they absolutely crush it. Um, so just do whatever you can to make them happy and motivated and they will reward you with some of the most beautiful stuff you'll ever see. Um, one other note, please check out Islands of Insight. Um, it's only been out for a month and a half, so not a lot of people have played it yet. If you haven't, um, please check it out. It's freaking awesome. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, it just takes me a second to jump back into the call here. Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. That was amazing. And I, I'm glad you highlighted that in your conclusions. Um, you gave 20 something people jobs, people who just love making puzzles, and you gave them jobs. That was amazing. Um, uh, there was lots of love for the talk in the chats. Uh, I think we might not have any time for questions, though. Yeah, I, I may just go through the chat on YouTube and kind of add oh. some people and, and reply to them. Yeah, absolutely. That would be amazing. Um, one yep. final plug is we are, um, you know, we're, we're interested. We're looking forward to new projects. And some of those puzzled designers, those amazing people, they are available for new work. Um, you know, if, if, uh, if anybody knows of anything or is interested in working with us, let me know. Let's keep those puzzle designers in, in work, making great I, puzzles. I love finding jobs for incredible puzzles. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Um, and